A quienes dejaron su tierra Les dedico esta canción Les dedico esta canción A quienes dejaron su tierra When I was a child growing up, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. She had six children with my dad, of course. And my dad was, um, he was in the military, one time in the Navy, and then he was a plumber, became a, na an, um, a master plumber, and he also was a fireman in our city, Columbus, Ohio. What sticks out most in my mind in educationally growing up was my first elementary school I went to was a public school. I went there until the fourth grade. And at the fourth grade, my mom was sick and had to go to the hospital. And she felt that when she was sick, someone had to take care of us, but that her, her church did not reach out to her. But my brother, who had gone to a Catholic school, the priest came to see her, and as soon as she got better, she took us all away from public schools and put us in the Catholic schools. So that's what sticks out most in my mind, is my training uh, at, in the Catholic schools. And I went to the Catholic schools from fourth grade through high school. What I remember, remember about the Catholic school, maybe one or two things. One is that during Lent, they taught us to make the sacrifices save our pennies in a bank for people who were less fortunate. So that's what we did over Lent season. That's one. Another thing that I remember with the Catholic education that I got is that I didn't see any prejudice about anybody. If they taught about another religion, for example, the Jewish religion, it was that it's a Jewish, it's a different religion but no feelings about it. No feelings about, we had um, migrants from um, different places. We received everyone, but no prejudice against people. I learned about that prejudice when I was in college, that even against Jewish people, that there were the people didn't want their children playing with Jewish children. And I never heard of that, even from a Catholic, environment. So those are two things that really stick out with me. I graduated from high school in 1960, went to Ohio U, and that's where I found out about the prejudice. And between that time and going to Ohio State is when I met Dr. Martin Luther King and became one of his mentees. I saw an ad in the newspaper that said, learn speed writing come and learn speed writing and I've always wanted to be an international interpreter. So I called the school, found the address, went to the school. You had to go up steps to get to the school and open the door and someone met me at the door and that person said, uh, I said, I, I came to sign up for this class. <clears throat> And the person put his arm around me and said, do you know any nice little colored girls who go to our evening school? I said, no, I don't know anybody. I work at night. I want to go daytime. He said, are you sure? Kept walking with me. No, I don't know anybody. He kept asking me two or three times. Then I said, is it that you don't accept colored people during the daytime? He said, no, we don't accept colored people during the daytime. And by that time, we had walked through the offices, and he was leading me down the back steps. <laughs> I came up the front, but he sent me down. I was so shocked. I went home. I called a relative who was in the NACP because they were trying to get people to work uh, in different places then. And they sent in uh, a young lady whose mother was white, the father was black, to the same place to see if she could get into school in the daytime, and she did. So they opened a case, and then they called me and asked me if I wanted to go to the school that they work things out. I said, no, I'm not interested. So they asked me, so you're not working during the daytime? I said, no, I'm not working during the daytime, only at night. They said, well, could you go around the city and put in 
<clears throat> applications to work at utility companies or banks. We are trying to get these utility companies or banks to accept blacks. So I said, fine, and that's what I did. So all summer, I filled out applications, went to one place after the other, and by August, that was in June, by August, they called and said, I and another young lady would be the first two first black people to work in the bank other than janitorial <clears throat> or running the elevators. So we dropped out of school that year to go and serve, to work in the bank. We were trained and received great grades and so on. And during that, of course, that article hit all the newspapers, the magazines all over the country. And of course, they considered us, I guess, pioneers or whatever. And that's when, before then, Dr. Martin Luther King would come to my city and I lived down the street from one of the pastors that he knew. So he would always say, we're the young people. So when this happened, of course, they called us together as young leaders and that they wanted us to be involved with what was going on uh, throughout the country. And that was in 1962-63. I was one of those young people that they put up as a leader and uh, Louis Armstrong, when anybody would come to town, they would, uh, that's how I got to meet most of the civil rights people. They would ask us to come and meet them. And that's how I met Louis Armstrong and his wife. They launched a book in Columbus called Fight for Freedom. And that book itself was the history of the NAACP. And that's how I got to meet him and his wife. I came to Orange County in 2000, so from 84 to 2000. We started the Hall of Fame in 1992 because the experience showed us that teachers are givers. They have time to talk to young people, to mentor, and so on. And, and we decided that they need to be honored more. Society puts teachers on the back burner, doesn't pay them as much as they pay the students of the teachers. Some arts, some artists, and athletes they get paid in a year more than their teachers do in a lifetime. <laughs> so we felt the teachers need to be honored. And they were the many of the people who put their hands on our children. If we had a child who wanted to be an artist and you found an art teacher, they'd come and shadow me. They would teach them everything. So that's the other arm of Youth on the Move. Those were some of the mentors. The, the mission statement for Youth on the Move is to help, this program is to help youth succeed in life with the help of positive community role models. And you know, I, looking at it now, I'm sure I learned that from people like Dr. Martin Luther King. When he'd come to town, he'd always say, where are the youth? So they would call and say, Dr. King is coming. And you once you have that, that's why we encourage people to do the same. Because once you do it, you never forget it. And then you give back. I became a Toastmaster in about nine, 2006. And uh, since then, I founded over five Toastmaster clubs, which is, which is unusual. And been all around. I've been to more than 50 Toastmaster clubs around the world. So Toastmasters is one of the top organizations and in the world. I joined Toastmasters because the Spirit told me to at that time. People had always been asking me, and I've admired them, but I was always busy. And I joined at Crystal Cathedral, one of the clubs there. And why did I join and stay and create others? Because there's no other organization like it. The people ha all have stories the kindest people in the world, they're givers, like teachers, <laughs> like ministers. It's a giving organization. And what I really like about it, it teaches us how to get your message across. Because you can have a message and won't know how to transfer it to someone else. It could be through humor. My, I've probably visited almost every country in Europe. Germany, Italy, just just all of the countries. 
I spent a lot of time, of course, in Africa, different parts of Africa, French-speaking Africa, China, Taiwan, Fiji. Um, I've been to Haiti. I haven't been to South America that much. Yes, those are some of the places. Mm -hmm. The first time I went to Africa was in the 60s. And it was during the war. Uh -huh. okay. My ancestry is also Nigerian. I'm from the eastern part. My husband's from the west. And in the 60s, there was conflict between those two groups. I think education is the foundation of everything. The knowledge, the awareness, the curiosity. I've been in many countries where education hasn't been the strongest when it comes to formal education. But I find that most countries have some type of moral education, or then even moral education is important, because then you don't go about killing people <laughs> or imprisoning people. Uh, the education, I, I, I think that we don't put enough emphasis on education. Moral education, family education, all kinds of education that bring people together and being a mentee of Dr. Martin Luther King, I certainly 200% believe in his philosophy of the beloved community. All people need to come together and love one another. And that has to do with education. Do you know about another group or you're standing there giving your own biased opinion and not having, not having met them or gone there? So I think that education about cultures, about people, is very important also. I was hired to go to Egypt for a year to train teachers. And at this school that I went to, it was a comprehensive high school, 2,000 people, but it was also a buy-in where you put your school there for an investment. And half of the teachers in that school were the parents of the kids in the school. So you would, you would put your child in the school and pay, and you would also teach. And if you taught in that school, if, you had a, if I had a second grader and you have a third grader, and I'm the second grade teacher, because I want you to do the best for my kids, I'm going to do the best for your children in my school. The teachers spend a lot of their own money to make their classrooms competitive, uh, not in a negative way, but the children will learn. And you went through the system. If you go through the system, your children are not there anymore. You may decide to leave your money there because you see the good. And I look at it and I say, you know what? This probably will work, could work in America. Because many of our teachers, many of our people are teachers anyway. They may not work in the schools, but you have a vested interest in that particular school. And I was very impressed. They, in that particular school also, there was a teacher's research and development center as part of the school. This school also was innovative in the sense that it had a whole disabled unit. Before in Egypt, if your child is disabled, you keep them in the closet. They don't see the light of day. Somebody went in and, it, and it explained to them. So they had a whole wing for people to bring their children and be worked with with disabilities and so on. So I, I really admired what I saw and I thought, this could be a good model for education. I would, I would have a small group or, or big groups or whatever but I would engage the parents and I would educate the parents about the differences in schools, mm -hmm. about te teachers, just and, and, and encourage them to be broader minded, to be receptive and get as much positive morality going as, as, as much. The need for all people to come together.